So today, we stand at the dawn of the neuro revolution. While thought leaders of the world like Elon Musk are uh, reaching for the stars, trying to expand humanity upwards and outwards, there is a, another development that is materializing, and that is the journey inwards. The rapid acceleration of technology is presenting new ways of reverse engineering our biology by not just connecting technology to our body, but actually uh, putting it into our body. The universe within us, our brains and our minds, is just as vast and complex and arguably more important than the universe beyond. Though philosophers and physicists have been theorizing about it for thousands of years, we essentially know nothing about the relationship between the brain and the mind. Today we stand at an inflection point in human evolution. The technological revolution has provided us with tools and techniques for actually peering into the brain. These tools are allowing us to finally deconstruct the subcomponents of consciousness, what it is, why it fails, why it fades, how it can be fixed, and how it can be enhanced. So my name is Connor Rusumano, and I am a brain hacker standing at the dawn of the neuro revolution, uh, working to push the technology forward for the benefit of humanity. The brain is an ocean of electricity, and I really like this analogy because um, with technology like this, we can essentially stand on the beach, um, and here you see some waves, right? So we can stand on the beach and we can uh, watch the waves of electricity crash on the beach, and then we can try to make inferences about what's going on in the middle of the ocean, maybe some wind patterns, a storm, a plate shifting under the ocean. And all of that is correlated, you know, the analogy here, those are your thoughts, your emotions, the, the, the brain activity that's triggering actions. Um, so keep that analogy in your mind for the rest of the talk, but, you know, in addition to non-invasive technology like this, there is, a, there is another form of technology, which is invasive brain-computer inter interfacing, or BCI. Remember that ac acronym, BCI, I'll be using it throughout the talk. Um, so invasive technology... Uh, is, is pretty new, um, but there are essentially sensors that you can implant into your brain, and obviously the risk, the health concerns are a little bit more, uh, more concerning, um, but you can essentially record your neurons at the source. You can, you can dig into the brain. You don't have to have the skull and the skin and the sweat um, essentially distorting the signal, but obviously there are some limitations here in ter terms of health and safety. So another comparison, though, I want you to, to think about uh, when, when thinking about the space of BCI is this, this new paradigm of neuromodulation. So we've been able to record brain activity for a long period of time, almost 100 years, uh, but only recently have we started researching how to actually stimulate the brain with electricity um, to essentially have an input mechanism in addition to an output mechanism. So this is really fascinating because what it does is it presents us with this opportunity to create uh, what we call a closed loop brain-computer interface, essentially a feedback loop system where we can both um, record and stimulate and essentially try to bias the brain or coerce the brain in a certain direction. So either using constructive interference patterns or destructive interference patterns, we can optimize the brain to think a certain way or, or to feel a certain way or also um, push it away from places that we don't want it to go. So these technologies will inevitably replace our current interfaces to computers, the mouse, the keyboard, voice recognition, et cetera. Um, but in addition, they will also serve as a very essential barrier between our brains, our, our you know, neural composition, and the artificial intelligence systems that we're developing, we hear so much about in the news uh, and in Hollywood today. I want to tell you a story. This is the story of my, brain, my favorite brain hacker of all time. His name is Gal Sant. I first met Gall in Tel Aviv at the Braintech 2015 conference. Gall was being pushed, uh, pushed around in a wheelchair by his friend Dan. Um, and I was wearing the first prototype of this headset, which was you know, just as silly looking as this one. Um, but Gall rolls up, and uh, on his face is just this undeniable sense of uh, just wonder and delight. Um, and you know, he immediately recognized the implications of this technology. So at the age of, of 33, Gall was diagnosed with ALS, which um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, but it's a very sad and rapidly progressing motor degenerative disease that essentially um, breaks the connection between the brain and the muscles. And so you slowly start to lose the ability to control your body, um, which you can imagine is, is pretty sad. But as a natural born neurohacker and programmer, Gall decided to take matters into his own hands, and he started a company called Click to Speak, 
which essentially was an on-screen on keyboard that he could use to communicate. Um, and amazingly, he used his tool to continue to build his tool um, for a long time. And so he was you know, essentially just hacking his way back into the world. So when I asked Gall if he wanted his own Ultra Cortex, this was about a year ago, this is what he wrote back to me. I would love to have an Ultra Cortex fitted to my head. I'm constantly in touch with universities and individuals regarding BCI, and the biggest problem is to obtain affordable hardware and uh, affordable and high-quality hardware. I've written a layer of code in my keyboard to interact with EEG hardware, and I'm now waiting for the right one. I will use it mainly sitting. I would like to develop the ability to control the TV or speak while I'm not in front of a computer screen. So this was a big limitation for him, is that the only tool he had, he had to be looking at a computer screen that was tracking his eyes as he was navigating the screen. Tell me how I can help, Gall. Last May, Gall passed away. Ultimately, he decided to be taken off of life support because he could not take care of himself, and he no longer wanted to burden the people he loved most, his wife and his two daughters. Gall spent over six years hacking his way back into reality allowing himself to communicate with the people he loved. Gall was one of the most relentlessly positive people I've ever met, and his attitude and love for life was incredibly infectious. Gall inspired me as, as much as any person I have ever met, and he continues to inspire me today. I believe that the future of BCI will prevent tragedies like Gall's from ever happening. Though Gall's nervous system failed him, his, his mind was 100% intact. He would, he would write the most eloquent emails, uh, even though he could barely move. People like Gall who suffer from motor degenerative diseases such as ALS will eventually use BCI systems as a mean to not just communicate with the world, but care for themselves. That's just the beginning, though. In the next 10 to 20 years, BCI technologies will be used to fight depression, attention deficit disorder, PTSD, dementia, and much, much more. And eventually, I believe that we will all use BCI systems uh, or brain-machine interfaces to communicate seamlessly and interface with the world and extend our intelligence. So that brings us to OpenBCI. Uh, I run a company called OpenBCI, and we build open source hardware and software for interfacing the human brain and body. When we started OpenBCI three years ago, this was our mission statement. The biggest challenges we face in understanding what makes us who we are and what we will become will not be solved by a single company, an institution, or even an entire field of science. These discoveries will only and should only be made through an open forum of shared knowledge and concerted effort by a people from a variety of backgrounds and disciplines. We work to harness the power of the open source movement to accelerate ethical innovation in brain-computer interface technologies. Today, OpenBCI, we have sold over uh, to hardware, low-cost hardware, to over 70 different countries, uh, and our technology is being worked with in every continent except for Antarctica. We are democratizing the field of neurotechnology. We are allowing for the tech to come out of the laboratory and be put into the real world for the first time. Ten years ago, a standard EEG system that was worked with in laboratories uh, cost between $50,000 and $100,000 and was only being worked with cutting-edge uh, laboratories and elite research institutions. Today, we sell a four-channel EEG system for just $100. So universities will soon be doing distributed research like never before. Um, and, I, and I believe that you know, this is something we're really working towards is, is this new learning paradigm where every student in the class has their own EEG device as opposed to just one very expensive device being owned by the laboratory. So now let me show you how it works. So you're probably wondering what this funny thing is on my head. This is the, we call it the ultra cortex or the extension of the neocortex, ultra meaning final. Um, and what it's doing right now is recording eight channels of electrical brain activity uh, and muscle activity from my head. And so you can see my little head plot there, channels one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So those are mapped to these eight channels here. So like I said, this, this ocean of electricity in my head, this is almost like there are eight people standing on eight different beaches and watching these waves crash on the beach and then just mapping it into the, into the computer screen. So, what I want to do is I want to show you some really cool uh, interactivity that I have. Um, so I'm going to pick someone random from the audience. Someone raise their hand. First one to raise their hand. Okay, you, right there. So you can see there's these three bars here, right? So I want you to tell me which one to activate, either left, right, or middle, and I'm going to do it on command without, without moving 
anything. Right. Oh, we, wrong one, sorry. That was my fault. Go again. <laughs> So, yeah. so the amazing thing is that any one of you could come up here, and, you know, and I'd have to adjust the headset to fit your head, but the learning curve for that is very quick. Um, I'm using micro expressions of my face, just little EMG signals to trigger the, the interface. And the amazing thing is that people with ALS, like, like Gall, 90% um, of ALS patients maintain motor function until they die, which means even though the muscles aren't working the way they're supposed to, there's still residual muscle movement that can be tapped into and used like this. So when I, when I think about this interface and how, how cheap and cost effective, it is now, how cost effective it is now, I think about Gaul and how many people like Gaul could benefit from technology like this if we just applied it. Um, now I want to show you something that's a little bit trickier to do, but I want to show you a brainwave. So, do you see my little cursor there? When I stop moving, all the waves will come down. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to close my eyes. And you'll see um, kind of like a camel hump in the data. And this is an alpha brain wave. Uh, so I want to show you, brain waves are pretty cool. I want to show you how to do this. Let me know when it's happening, um, after it's happened for a little while, because I, I can't tell because my eyes are closed. Anything? Oh, you see the little hump there? You guys are supposed to let me know. <laughs> okay, did you get it? Did you see it? The little camel hump? So that's a brainwave, that's an alpha frequency that your visual cortex produces when it's no longer being spammed by visual stimuli from your environment. And your, the rest of your brain works in a very similar way, it's just harder to demonstrate. Cool, so. I'm sure you're wondering, what can BCI do for you today? How can it help you? Um, the reality is, like I said earlier, uh, we're basically standing on the beach, staring out at this vast blue ocean with the means of exploring it, truly exploring it for the first time. So while there, there aren't many commercial EEG systems or, or applications in the, in the world today, I do believe that will happen soon in the next five years. But, you know, we've talked about quantified self. I think this technology has huge implications for DIY neuroscience and the quantified self movement. Being able to track quantitatively the correlations between your daily actions, your activities, and then also your mood and your state of mind. These are things that we've almost always understood as qualitative, like, oh, I'm in a bad mood today, or I'm not feeling very product productive, or I'm a little bit stressed. You know, it's really hard to attach a number to that, but I believe that EEG is the perfect tool to do so. In addition, you know, I, I didn't discover this technology until I was 23 years old. So, you know, I, I think we have a huge impact, or we can make an, a huge impact in the space of education that's been talked about a lot today. You know, I like to think of the 12-year-old version of myself, and how do I inspire that kid to want to start working with this technology now to have an additional, an, an additional 10 years of inspiration and knowledge around this entire subject? So, in many ways, I like to think of our technology as like the, the homebrew chemistry, home chemistry kit, or like the Lego kit of the 21st century. So... All you parents out there, go buy one for your kids. <laughs> so the future of BCI is undoubtedly exciting, but it is also delicate and must be pro approached with the proper design constraints. Whether we like it or not, our relationship with technology will continue to become more discreet, more passive, and ever-present. But when we think about the integration of augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, brain-machine interfacing, it's not too difficult to imagine some seriously dystopian scenarios where humans lose control of the most important thing that we own, our mind. And when you consider the potential of the closed loop BCI systems that I talked about earlier, where BCIs are not just serving as a recording, but they're also serving, they're serving as an input mechanism to the brain, these scenarios seem even more likely. So for this reason, people, people need to start becoming aware of the technology, its capabilities, and its, and its implications. All that said, I do believe that the future holds more good than bad. Uh, we just need to make sure that we work together to get it right. I strive to support those who have an irresistible urge to understand and expand the extraordinary system that is the human brain. I focus to use technology to explore the limits of our consciousness in an ethically befitting manner. 
I strongly believe that an open approach is necessary on a voyage such as this in order for it to be done in a way that truly aids the development of humanity as a whole. I now encourage all of you to join me on this journey into the infinitely complex phenomenon that we know as the human mind. Thank you. <laughs>